Okay, hi everyone. Um, welcome to our colloquium today. Uh, so, our speaker today is Dr. Fiorella Prada uh, from our own uh, Department of Marine and Coastal Sciences. And so, um, uh, Dr. Prada mentioned that she has some, some information about her background, but I'll just share that. So, she got her undergrad and PhD in Italy at Parma and then Bologna. Um, and then she did a postdoc uh, in, again, in Italy before doing another postdoc um, at Rutgers. And then ultimately, she has just joined DMCS starting this, this September September mm -hmm. as, a, as a new faculty member. So we're all excited to get to meet her and get to know her um, and hear all about the exciting things that she is working on, um, including, uh, I think this is an unusual skill on her CV, but it's underwater field sampling. So she's also an accomplished diver and has dived all over the Mediterranean. So if you want to chat with her about that, too. So thank you, Fiorella. Thank you, Ben. Um, can everyone hear me on Zoom? I can just talk, okay. Okay, thank you so much for inviting me here. I'm very excited. Uh, it's, I must admit, it's my first time here at EPS. I should have come sooner. I've been at Rutgers already for a year and a half. Uh, but let me just tell you that uh, it's been a very, very exciting path so far. and. Um, so the focus of my research, which is still the focus today, is to study how marine calcifiers respond and potentially adapt to changing environmental conditions. But before we start with the science, I'd like to give you a very brief introduction of who I am. So I was born in Costa Rica uh, and then started moving around when I was really young. Uh, my father was working for the United Nations at the time, and so we moved to Africa, to Mozambique in particular, for a few years, for eight years, more or less. After this African period, uh, we, got, um, we got moved to New York City, which is pretty, um, it's a paradox to, to be here after such a long time as an adult and as a professional, to go back more or less to the same place. And, and it's, it's super exciting, but this transition was really, really dramatic because uh, you can imagine how Africa and New York don't really have too many things in common. Uh, but the really cool thing was that I had the opportunity to go to a very cool school, which was the United Nations International School. So I got exposed to an incredible amount of uh, people from all over the world. And that really, uh, it was a really great exposure to a very diverse environment. And it really got me thinking. and. And it really made me understand how important it is to work in a diverse environment and be exposed to so many different nationalities with, and people with different perspectives. So that's really important. So after this uh, New York period, I, I moved to Italy where I really started my academic path. So as Ben said, I got my bachelor's degree at the University of Parma. Parma is very famous for its, for its prosciutto crudo and for the Parmesan cheese but they also have a pretty good university. And so I, I did there my bachelor, bachelor's degree and my master's degree. My master's degree was in ecology. And in Parma, as you can imagine, it's in the middle of, uh, basically, I'll show you here. It's in the middle of, of Emilia Romagna up here. So there's not really much access to, to the sea. So there was basically nothing going on at the university that had to do with marine sciences. and so. I reached out to the University of Bologna, which is still here in the middle of, of, of fields, basically. But they did have a strong group that was working on corals and climate change. And they had uh, also a diving school that allowed us to perform field studies at sea. And so I, I reached out to them and I, started, I did my, mas my master's thesis with them. And then I continued working with them on corals and how they respond in terms of um, skeletal structural features and how these change with temperature. So basically, we uh, collected corals along this wide latitudinal gradient that covers pretty much 900 kilometers, which corresponds roughly to 200 degrees Celsius. And we assessed how corals, coral populations responded in terms of population dynamics and, and calcification and reproduction. And so this was really the beginning of my, my research on this topic, which then continued at the University of Bologna with several postdocs uh, and all the way until 
a year and a half ago, more or less, when I moved here to Rutgers to work on how corals biomineralize. So to study bi basically the mechanisms that drive the biomineralization process in corals with Paul Fokowski. So let's start with the science. So marine calcifiers are organisms that build calcium carbonate structures from calcium carbonate and or bicarbonate ions. And these organisms are fundamental players in shaping our planet by providing crucial ecosystem and biogeochemical functions. In fact, it has been estimated that the contribution to the global carbon budget of three of the main groups of calcifiers, which are shown here in this slide, which are reef building corals, so harder stony corals, uh, single celled protists, which are foraminifera, and single celled algae, which are coccolithophores, has been estimated to be around 3.5 gigatons of calcium carbonate per year, which corresponds roughly to 600 Giza pyramids. So through the production, sinking, and dissolution of this incredible amount of material, these organisms play a fundamental role in marine carbon cycling <coughs> and also in uh, ocean atmosphere CO2 exchange, which means that these organisms uh, have a significant impact on our climate. But these organisms are also in turn impacted by climate itself. And many of these calcifiers, in fact, uh, are very sensitive even to the slightest changes, changes in environmental conditions. We also know that these organisms have been around for hundreds of millions of years of global climate change. So what are their secrets? What are their secret weapons that allowed them to survive in the past and has allowed them to still be here today? So this is really where the overarching goal of my research stems from, which is to investigate how marine calcifiers and specifically corals um, are affected by the environment and how the environment is in turn affected by them, both whether they're under healthy conditions as up here, as shown up here, but also under unhealthy conditions. So why corals? Well, there are a million reasons why corals are amazing creatures and fascinating organisms to study. First of all, they are ecosystem engineers, and specifically I'm talking about the reef building corals, which are the stony corals, which means that they are capable of building complex three-dimensional structures that are the foundation for hundreds of thousands of species. In fact, these ecosystems uh, harbor more biodiversity in only 1% of of seafloor uh, um, occupation, basically, than any other ecosystem on Earth. And they support also uh, 25 to 40 percent of fisheries on which people that live along coastal areas depend on. So these organisms are important for all the species that live in these ecosystems in terms of nutrition, in terms of, of uh, nursery, in terms of uh, um, protection from, uh, from predators. And at the same time, they're very important for human beings as well for these many of the same reasons. In addition to, of course, economic revenue and protection against storms or coastal erosion. However, corals are really fascinating creatures also because of their innate ability to overcome dramatic environmental change. As witnessed by their incredible history of evolution adapt and adaptation throughout hundreds of millions of years of global climate change, as you can see here in this slide. So I'll, I'll walk you through it. On the top panel, panel A, you can see the global surface, uh, global ocean surface pH in pink. Please note that the axis has been inverted so that the stressors are shown from the top to the bottom, to from the bottom to the top, sorry. And the, in light blue, you have the sea surface temperatures in the past 250 million years. And on the bottom panel, you have the number of uh, coral genera, of uh, stony coral genera. For now, just ignore the difference between the green and the, the, the yellow. So all of this is shown in the past 250 million years ago because uh, this is where, so in the early Triassic is when uh, modern reef building corals evolved to ecological prominence, which means that these organisms managed to survive at least three major climate transitions, which are shown by these three vertical lines over here. So when we try to predict how these organisms will uh, respond and survive to current and predicted climate change, we tend to look back at these events and try to understand how these organisms and other organisms survived in the past. Uh, in fact, some of these events, at least, uh, have, um, are considered analogs of current climate change in terms of magnitude and, most importantly, in terms of rate, which is how quickly those changes uh, developed even though both of these aspects are still very debated and highly controversial. But the truth is that these organisms survived. They survived 
massive volcanism, which led to ocean acidification, ocean warming, and to events that were also abrupt, such as asteroid impacts, and they're still here today. So how is that possible? How did they survive? And will whatever allowed them to survive in the past allow them to survive in the future? So one of their secret weapons is uh, for sure their symbiosis with unicellular algae. Uh, in fact, the algae uh, convert light energy into chemical energy that is stored in the form of carbohydrates, lipids, and amino acids that are transferred from the algae to the host in exchange for shelter and for inorganic compounds, which are basically the metabolites of the coral, which are recycled by the algae in a truly mutualistic symbiosis, which means that both parties have some kind of benefit from this relationship. And this mutualistic symbiosis has really been the key to their survival and to their, to their thrival in uh, shallow water, tropical, oligotrophic, which means nutrient-limited conditions. So again, these organisms were, were capable of making the best out of the resources they had in, those in, in that environment, which was basically light energy. So these are endosymbionts. So they're stored, which means that they're stored inside the tissue of the coral. Here, I'm just going to show you very quickly what a coral looks like and how it's made, basically. So here on the left, you can see a picture of a very common tropical zooxanthellate coral. Zooxanthellate means that it has this symbiosis with these algae, which are, are called zooxanthellae. And this species is colonial, and is in particular, this one is made of hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of tiny polyps that you can see here in the zoomed image that are connected to each other by a very thin layer that is called cenozarch. So these polyps are all genetically identical to each other and they are formed asexually by the colony. Uh, so basically the way a coral is made is it's made of a calcium carbonate structure underneath that has sort of these cup-like features over here that you see here in the drawing up here. And the, the coral polyps lie on top of these cup-like structures sort of like a glove would cover a glass or a beaker. So the tentacles are basically your fingers and in the middle you have the gut uh, and the gastrovascular cavity. So if we look at a cross section of this tissue, of, a cor of the coral tissue, we can see that it, it's made of two uh, main tissue layers, which are the oral and the, abo uh, the oral and aboral tissues. So the oral tissue and both of these tissues are, are divided into two uh, into two additional layers basically. So starting from the outside, the oral ectoderm is the one facing the seawater and then as we go in we have the oral endoderm which faces the slantern which is the gastrovascular cavity of the coral. And this is where we have some of the zooxanthellae. Then we have another tissue layer which is the aboral endoderm which also hosts some of the zooxanthellae and finally the, the most important one for today's seminar is the, the aboral ectoderm, which is also more commonly referred to as calicodermis. So this tissue is made of very specialized cells, which are called calicoblastic cells, which pr uh, are responsible for the precipitation of the calcium carbonate skeleton. So these cells are separated from the skeleton by a very thin layer of only a few nanometers, so a couple microns wide, uh, called extracellular calcifying fluid. And this fluid is where the calcification reactions actually take place. So let's take a, a closer look at this fluid for a second. So the composition of this fluid, in terms of ions, in terms of pH, is uh, regulated by uh, passive pathways, which are uh, paracellular pathways shown here as number two, and by transcellular pathways, which are active pathways shown here as number one. And so we know from several studies that have investigated the composition of this fluid that its composition is actually quite different from that of the external seawater environment, uh, which means that not only is it, not only is this fluid in a way isolated and um, uh, yeah, like partially isolated from the external environment, but also that the coral exer exerts a strong biological control over its composition. And how, so how does it do this? Well, first of all, we know that the pH of this fluid, for instance, is significantly higher in most species compared to the external seawater environment. So, well, on the outside you can have a pH of 8.1 and here you can have a pH of 8.7. And this pH is maintained elevated even when the external seawater environment becomes more acidic and goes down to pH 7.7, .7, for instance, which is really low. The way the coral does this is through the activity of these calcium ATPase pumps 
which are uh, basically pumping in calcium ions into this fluid in exchange for protons. Protons that are generated during the calcification process, which is shown down here, and generates CO2 and therefore protons. The protons are generated also through these bicarbonate transporters, which transport bicarbonate into the fluid, actively transport it into the fluid, and so then this bicarbonate uh, reacts, combines with the calcium uh, mm, um, uh, uh, liberating protons, which are then again expelled by these uh, calcium ATPase pumps into the outer environment, maintaining an alkaline environment in here. A third very important component, which I will go a bit more into depth later into this presentation, is this orange organic matrix over here. So this organic matrix is a composite of lipids, polysaccharides, and proteins that are produced by the calicoblastic cells and secreted by the cells into this fluid. And what this organic matrix does, it's cr it creates an organic template that induces the precipitation of the mineral phase. So it has a very, very important role in the bionization process. And uh, so we've been able to identify some of the proteins that are in this organic matrix. Uh, and some of these proteins were a we, we were able to, uh, uh, to express and to induce the precipitation of aragonite in vitro, which means in a test tube, even at pH 7.6, even with just one kind of protein. And we have many different kinds of proteins in here. So what does this mean? It means that, first of all, oh, you can't really see the title. The first of all, um, the bionization process is much more complex than we can possibly imagine. And it means that it's really important, this is, and this is one of the reasons why it's so important to understand how it works, because it will allow us to understand how these organisms survived in the past and how they might survive in the future. Uh, because of course, bio the bionization process is not just merely a function of changing environmental conditions, such as decreasing pH or decreasing carbon and ion concentrations, which are the two main consequences of ocean acidification. But so how can, we study, how can we study the impact of acidification on marine calcifiers and begin to understand how this works? We can do this by uh, using aquaria experiments, so controlled experiments. This is a very uh, impressive setup that is, was made in, uh, at the Inter-University Institute for Marine Sciences in uh, Israel, which is right next to the Red Sea. They have many, many different tanks, uh, so you can study many different conditions and expose your corals to uh, a, whole, a whole set of pH levels and, and also have several different replicates. So this is one way, but the other way, if you're lucky like I've been, uh, is to use natural laboratories. And CO2 vents are one of these natural laboratories you can use for oceanification studies. Not all of them, of course, are valuable labs. Uh, in fact, the CO2 vents, which are basically emissions of carbon dioxide from the seabed, generally volcanic origin, as you, many of you know better than me for sure, uh, not all of them, though, are good candidates for this kind of study because they have to be at shallow depths so that we can easily access them by diving or snorkeling. They need to be at ambient temperature and they must also, also lack toxic compounds such as hydrogen sulfide. So there are several of these vents which are being used in the past, in the past few years. And three of these vents are found in the Mediterranean Sea. So I'll show you in a second. Basically, the first vent that was discovered uh, and studied was in Ischia Island, which is a little island up here off the coast of Naples uh, that has very, very shallow seepage at three meters depth, more or less. And then there are two vents in this volcanic archipelago called Aeolian Archipelago. So there's one here in Vulcano Island. This is the name. And this is Panarea Island, which is the island I had the opportunity to work in. So basically, I'm going to show you a very short video of what this vent looks like down there. You have this very uh, impressive column of bubbles, of almost pure CO2 bubbles, 98 to 99 percent, that acidifies the surrounding seawater. The crater is <laughs> at 12 meters depth, which is more or less 40 feet. 
And so as you swim away from the center of the crater, you have the lowest pH levels, of course, close to the bubbling. And as you get further away from the crater, normal pH conditions are restored more or less 34 meters away from the center of the, of the emissions. So what we did was we performed several different studies along this gradient, among which transplant experiments, but we also studied the calcifiers that naturally grow along this gradient. And so we studied uh, uh, calcifying algae, we studied a solitary zooxanthellid coral that will be the focus of our, of our talk today. So basically what this uh, system does is it basically replaces time for space. What does this mean? It means that along this gradient we have pH conditions that pretty much match uh, scenarios predicted for the end of the century by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So at the periphery of our transect, so the, the, the side that's furthest away from the, from the emissions has a normal pH condition, of course, that matches today's pH. Uh, then we have an intermediate pH in site two, and then a very low pH, which corresponds to a business as usual scenario. Basically, if we continue burning fuel, uh, fossil fuels like we're doing, this is what they expect the oceans will look like in 2100. And then we have site number four, which we will not talk about today, which goes even further down. So here are just two or three more videos that I'd like to show you on some of the activities we conducted down there. So here I was in the, in the center of the, of the crater, taking measurements, pH, temperature, salinity measurements with this probe. And it's really, it's really an amazing experience to dive there, especially at the, at the beginning, because it, it really looks like a lunar kind of environment. You see this white spot in the middle of, of, these, of, of this seabed, and you see this bubbling, which is really impressive. And the actual acidity is really palpable, because when you dive on top of it, and the bubbles touch your skin, you can really feel them tingling on your skin. So it's pretty, the pH goes pretty low here. Over here, we were taking uh, uh, photosynthetic efficiency measurements with an underwater fluorometer. And here we were uh, measuring one of these solitary zooxanthellid corals. And on the bottom here, we were taking uh, some biometric measurements. So basically, we were measuring the sizes of the corals, which allowed us to estimate the, the growth of the species along the gradient. So what all of these studies allowed us to do was to investigate how this particular species, this model coral species, uh, acclimatized to decreasing pH uh, in terms of population abundance and also in terms of a whole series of other parameters which included growth, as I mentioned, but also reproduction, physiology, microbiome composition. But today, with I would like to focus your attention only on the population scale and also on the skeletal phenotype. Uh, so everything that had to do with the structural features of the skeleton and how these changed or did not change with decreasing pH. So from this slide on, I will show you a few results. They're all uh, formatted in the same way. So you will always find the normal pH condition in blue on the right and then an intermediate in green and a low pH treatment in red on the left. So here, uh, of course, the first thing we observed, even without taking any measurements, was that the population density decreased. And so we measured it by photo quadrats, which obviously gave us very clear uh, mm, results on, on the decrease of the population density of the species with decreasing pH. And this was done in collaboration with Michela Reggi, which was, uh, she was a, a bachelor student at the time, and, and it was actually an amazing experience to also be able to share and to, to conduct this kind of research also with students and taking them to the field and involving them in this really exciting stuff, uh, really exciting uh, work. So the next step to try and understand why the population density decreased was to investigate the growth. So growth in corals is the result of these three related parameters you see here in the slide which is net calcification rate, which is, which is how, m how much calcium carbonate is precipitated per millimeter square per year, which is the result of linear extension rate, which is how much it grows in length, where the length in this case is considered the maximum axis of the oral pole. So the oral pole is basically when you face the coral from the top, you're looking at its mouth, that's the oral pole. And this is the length. 
uh, multiplied by the skeletal bulk density, which is the density of the skeleton as a whole. I will explain in a second what I mean in as a whole. So basically, we try we uh, gain the information on net calcification rate by measuring linear extension rate and skeletal bulk density independently. So to measure linear extension rate, we applied a sclerochronological technique, which is based on growth band analysis by computerized tomography. So we basically, uh, we took these corals, we cleaned them, we bleached them, we, dr we dried them, and then we went to a hospital, tried to convince the doctors we were not completely nuts, and asked them to run scans on these corals, and they, I don't know why, maybe we exhausted them, and at the end they said yes, and we were able to get these images which show a very clear seasonal pattern, which we already knew these corals have. So you have high density bands in the winter, which is when they eat more, and low density bands in the summer. So by counting the number of bands, of high density bands, which are clearly more visible, we can determine the age of the specimens. And by dividing the length of the coral, so again, the maximum axis of the oral pole, by the number of years of that coral, we could get to the linear extension rates of these of, of these of the species along the gradient. The, boy, uh, the, the bulk density instead was measured with another non-invasive technique, which means that it didn't, we didn't have to destroy the samples and this allowed us to perform a, a series of other analyses I'll show you in a second. So the bulk density was measured again by point of weight, which means this technique is actually uh, based um, uh, on uh, Archimedes principle, which states that an object immersed in a fluid will displace a volume of fluid that is comparable, that is uh, yeah, the same basically as the volume of the submerged object. So this allowed us to get information on the volume of the matrix. So volume of the matrix is the volume of the calcium carbonate skeleton, including its organic material. Because the organic matrix I told you about at the beginning, as the coral grows layer by layer, it's incorporated into the skeleton and it can influence the mechanical properties of the skeleton, including its volume, of course, and including its density. So the volume of the skeleton and the volume of the pores uh, allowed us to, go to get to these three, uh, what are referred to as um, um, skeletal parameters, which are the microdensity, the porosity in percentage, and the bulk density, which is basically the density of the coral, including its porosity. So what we saw with uh, decreasing pH was a clear decline in the net calcification rates. And this decline was the result of a decline in the skeletal bulk density, while the linear extension rates remained constant. This is an important result because linear extension rates, for, for those of you who work or have, have worked on coral stuff, coral biology and ecology, it's a uh, it's one of the most used parameters to assess coral health. And what this is telling us is that it's really important to study how corals respond to changing environmental conditions, taking into account all the different parameters that make up coral growth, which are the ones shown here in the slide. So if we just had stopped into linear extension rates, we would have thought that these corals were doing just fine. But they're not. The skeletal density is decreasing, which means that the skeletons are potentially more fragile, but we will, we will talk th about this in two slides or more or so. So a decline in skeletal bulk density uh, seems to be a pretty common response uh, in corals. So again, here on the left, uh, this data set uh, was uh, analyzed by these two very, very talented uh, master students uh, who basically weighed hundreds of fragments of different species, four different coral species that were collected from uh, uh, Papua New Guinea CO2 vents. So they were collected from a control site and from a seep site, basically. Again, red and uh, blue and red. And so what this uh, analysis showed was, again, a very clear decreasing trend. And the same decreasing trend was, a set was also obtained by another group uh, in Monaco, Tambute, Tambute and colleagues, which are really have a very strong group, and, and they investigated how skeletal density was affected by decreasing pH in a year, in a, in a controlled experiment for one year. And again, as you can see, we have the same decreasing trend. So as I mentioned, this affects the mechanical properties of the skeleton, but how do we measure that? So we applied nano-indentation, which is a technique that is applied in material sciences, 
to investigate the mechanical properties of materials by uh, using a pointed uh, trigonal indenter that you can see here in this image up here. And so this pointed trigonal indenter um, it presses against your, the material and creates a deformation of your of your sample, and is that which is shown here in this in this image over here. So as it creates this uh, sort of print on the sample, it this crack sort of it is basically it allows allows us to get information on two different two important mechanical properties, which <coughs> are skeletal stiffness in this case skeletal stiffness, which is basically uh, the resistance to uh, mm, uh, reversible elastic deformation in a sample. So basically how uh, the tendency, it measures the tendency of a sample to return to its original form once a force is applied. And then on the hardness, which is the resistance to, pla to uh, elastic, no sorry, to plastic deformation, which is uh, basically resistance to breakage in a sample. So we know that these two parameters from previous studies we've conducted um, are linked to different structural features in the skeleton. And in general, the skeletal stiffness is uh, related to more macro scale features such as porosity. So we would expect that a, a variation in the porosity would lead to a change in the skeletal stiffness, while hardness are, is linked to more nano and micro scale features. So this was again confirmed in this study. So uh, with decreasing pH, we had a decline in the skeletal stiffness, which was associated with an increase in the skeletal porosity. While the, uh, and this again was done thanks to the, to the help and in collaboration with uh, Leonardo Brizzi, which was a PhD stu student at the time and just became assistant professor two days ago, by the way. So good for him. Um, so this, uh, the hardness did not change and this was uh, reflected in the microstructure, which as you can see here in the SEM images doesn't seem to show any major variations. It was also reflected in the mineralogy. So we also investigated the mineral composition of these uh, corals by XRD and, uh, and saw that the composition was pretty much the same. So uh, aragonite, almost 98% aragonite basically. And uh, finally, we also uh, estimated the amount of organic material inside the skeleton. So the way we did this was uh, by applying a technique that's called thermogravimetric analysis, which basically applies increasing degrees, increasing temperature intervals to a sample. And based on the phase that is released during the different temperature intervals and on the weight loss that we measured during that release, we can estimate how much organic material was uh, in the sample basically. And again, so we did this and the organic material seems to be pretty much the same regardless of external seawater pH. Okay, so continuing in this multi-scale voyage in the skelet of the skeletal phenotype of this coral with decreasing pH, the next step to try and understand why the, this bulk density was decreasing because we still don't understand why or what's making it decrease was to investigate the pH at the site of calcification. So the pH in that very thin fluid I mentioned at the beginning. And the way we did this was by using the boron isotope proxy. So as all of you know very well, uh, there are two dominant species of boron in the ocean, boric acid and borate ion. And the concentrations of these two species are pH dependent, which means that when we have an increase in the pH, we have increasing concentrations of borate ion at the expense of boric acid and vice versa when you decrease the pH. There are two isotopes of boron, boron 10 and boron 11. And by convention, uh, isotope ratios are uh, reported as delta values, which is basically uh, a means of comparing the ratio of the heavier isotope to the lighter is isotope of a sample to that of a standard. Since these variations are, are so tiny, uh, we multiply by a thousand. So which means that the final delta values are always in per mil. So we, always, we also know that there is a 27 per mil difference in the isotope fractionation between these two species. And finally, we also know that the borate ion is the species that is primarily incorporated in biominerals, such as coral skeletons. So by measuring the boron isotope composition of the skeletons, we can, and looking at this plot, we can estimate the pH at which that skeleton formed. Well, more, more or less here. So in collaboration with colleagues uh, from the Gelmar Institute in uh, Kiel, Germany, we applied a laser ablation to measure 
the pH of the site of calcification, which you can see here on this plot. And as you can see, the pH did not change significantly, at least along the gradient. So it was more or less always 8.4, 8.3, which means that the difference between the external seawater and between this calcifying fluid and the external seawater environment increased dramatically, of course. So the delta pH increased significantly from our control to the low pH site. Okay, so summing up, summing up these results, what we saw was that persistent acidified conditions uh, led to uh, changes at the macro scale level in the skeleton through a decrease in the bulk density, which translated into a decrease in the net calcification rate. While at the nano and micro scales, so in terms of mineralogy, organic ma matrix content, pH out of the site of calcification, we did not observe any significant changes. So the question still remains open. What, what, is leading, what is driving this decline in the bulk density? What is the underlying mechanism? So to try and answer this question, we have to get into the mechanisms of bionization. So the bionization process is a primarily biologically driven process in which the calicoblastic cells, which are shown here in this drawing in pink, produce this organic matrix, which is secreted uh, into the fluid. So several studies have shown that upon secretion of this organic matrix, we actually have the development, the deposition of an amorphous calcium carbonate phase in the form of uh, 100 nanometer more or less nanoparticles, which are shown here in this drawing by these sphere-like structures. So subsequently, this, these nanoparticles aggregate and act as building blocks for the precipitation of the aragonite crystal phase. So basically, this sequence of events translates into a so-called two-step model of coral calcification that I will drive you through in a second. So starting from this image on the top left, so this is a, a zoomed image of, uh, of a colonial coral. If we remove all the tissue from it, from the surface, we see that the bottom is made of these cup-like struc cup structures I mentioned at the beginning. So each of these cup-like structures is called a coralite. And each coralite is made of a external wall, which is called uh, is a calyx. And on the inside, you have these intersecting structures, which are septa. So if we look at a top rim of one of these septa, which is zoomed in in this image, we can see that it's not smooth. It's actually sort of bumpy. So it has these like bumpy structures. And if we zoom in even more into one of these structures, we can see that the internal morphology has this sort of layered kind of uh, uh, morphology, I guess, yes. So how is this layered pattern formed? It's formed through vertical rapid accretion of, vertical, ra ver vertical upward growth, sorry, of rapid accretion deposits, which are shown here in this image in light blue, uh, followed by uh, lateral thickening of aragonite fibers. And the important thing to remember here is that these rapid accretion deposits are very rich in organic material and in amorphous calcium carbonate. And these rapid accretion deposits are the same as these centers of calcification shown here. So different terminology, same, same feature. Of course, we like to make things complicated, so we find all sorts of ter terms to, to refer to the same thing, but this is what it means. <laughs> Okay, so vertical upward growth rap of rapid accretion deposits and lateral thickening of aragonite fibers, which are much less concentrated in terms of, uh, of organic material. So by now we have a pretty good understanding of the dynamic of the coral, of coral calcification, basically. What we still don't fully understand is how this organic material works, its composition and how the the proteins and that the other components work so in the past few years uh, there has been a lot of work and a lot of progress thanks to many proteomic studies that were able to identify by mass spec sequencing many of these proteins which have been shown to be to include uh, calcium binding proteins metal binding proteins um, adhesion and framework proteins and also the the, the so-called coral acid rich proteins or carps so these carps are rich in glutamic and aspartic acid, which create uh, negatively charged sites in the protein sequence that you, sh you can see here in this cartoon that strongly bind cations such as calcium. So uh, as soon as they were discovered, 
it was immediately hypothesized that they would play a very significant role in the binarization process. And this was in fact shown and proved by several studies. So these are, one th these are the proteins I mentioned at the beginning that we, we were able to express in the lab. And they were uh, able to induce the precipitation of aragonite at pH 7.6, which obviously um, uh, questions how much uh, decreasing aragonite saturation state conditions on the in the outer environment really affect the calcification process. But this is still a work in progress uh, debate, of course. Uh, sorry. So what all these proteins, uh, all these proteins have been basically grouped together into a so-called biominization toolkit. But this is not just a, cool, a toolkit. It is more of a factory because these proteins uh, work together. They talk to each other and, and, and form networks that uh, allow the bioionization process to occur. And this was shown uh, in, in, one in a coral species by Paul Falkowski's group a few years ago in which they conducted a cross-linking study and they were able to show these interactomes that you see here. So all of these are different proteins basically. Uh, so, the next question is, uh, do all kinds of calcifiers have just different groups of proteins and different in interaction networks among these proteins and therefore different mechanisms? Or is there something in common beto between all these calcifiers? Are there core bionization proteins and mechanisms that are shared by diverse calcifiers? So this is really the aim of my current research at Rutgers. So I'm currently uh, working on proteins that are be that we extracted from stony corals for aminifera and coccolithophores. Uh, it took us more than a year to develop the right protocol because a lot had been done on stony corals but almost nothing had been done in, well nothing has been done on foraminifera yet and only recently something was published on coccolithophores so um, so it, it took a long time to develop the right method but we managed to extract and sequence uh, these proteins. So we're currently in the process of understanding what's in there. And the next step will be to conduct uh, in collaboration with uh, bioinformaticians from uh, University of Emory uh, a network analysis to try and identify the underlying protein interaction networks uh, among not just these three groups of calcifiers but also among calcifiers of whom we have proteomes that are available in online databases. And, uh, and so this is one aim. And the second aim will be also to conduct uh, structural analysis on targeted proteins. And we will start with the acid acidic proteins, which we know have such a, an important role. And so we will try to crystallize them and to try and infer uh, more information on their function through these studies. OK, so I'm almost done. Two, <laughs> two more slides to go. Uh, <laughs> so uh, sort of uh, in an effort to try and merge Basically, the things I've learned in the past year and a half here at Rutgers and my previous work on in the field on climate change. Uh, so to try and answer the question that I just left you with. So how does the bulk density decrease? But there are other parameters that change. Does the, the, the organic matrix have a role in determining these variations in the skeleton? And how does it do it? So the idea is to try and, and investigate uh, uh, collect corals from natural aragonite saturation state gradients, such as the ones we can see at CO2 vents, or uh, where we can also compare different energy intake strat strategies, so zooxanthellate and non-zooxanthellate corals, so symbiotic and non-symbiotic. We can do the same thing using depth gradients. In fact, we have access to corals that have been collected of the same species, of course, along a wide depth gradient from 40 to 2,000 meters. And so the idea is to investigate how the structural features change and if these changes are correlated with changes in the content and composition of the organic matrix to try and, uh, and see if there's a relationship there. And the same thing we can do using upwelling systems. In particular, there's one upwelling system I'm targe targeting to work on in Costa Rica uh, in collaboration with uh, researchers from there. Okay, so last but not least, going back to our looping back into our original uh, question. So how do co did corals survive in the past and how will they survive in the future? So I said that uh, one of their secret weapons is the symbiosis with the unicellular algae. However, this is only true for shallow water coral species. And 
uh, shallow water coral species and symbiotic species in particular are just half of all known species. The rest are, are in the deep sea and therefore in the, in the incomplete darkness. Moreover, shallow water coral species are also the first ones to be hit by climate change, uh, such as heat waves and also by uh, anthropoge anthropogenic stressors. So a hypo hypothesis is that uh, they might have survived and hopefully survive in the future through deep sea communities uh, that could sort of uh, act as reservoirs that can recolonize, recolonize the surface when normal conditions are restored because the deep sea in, in a way is considered a climate change refugia because it's sort of to some extent more isolated, more isolated uh, to these kinds of changes compared to shallow water environments. So the idea is to try and address this uh, address this issue and also study these communities which we don't fully understand how they work, how they thrive down there because there is no light, they're under nutrient, nutrient limited conditions, almost under saturated conditions and uh, in very cold conditions, almost freezing to freezing point. Nonetheless, they managed to thrive down there and build really impressive coral reef structures in, in under those conditions. So how do they do it? The idea is to try and understand how they make a living down there with this project. And I'd like to, to try and develop a project using the Hudson Canyon as a case study, because this Hudson Canyon has been um, nominated as a natural marine sanctuary quite recently, actually, uh, in part because of the deep sea communities that make this habitat unique among other habitats in the New York Bight, apparently. But we still don't understand the, the comp species composition, the distribution of, of corals down there and how they make a living, how they eat. So, so yes, the idea is to, to develop a project ar around this question and to use all the resources we have, gliders, uh, Rutgers are really amazing uh, technological uh, uh, things we can use to obtain data on oceanographic conditions and uh, and also pr there's preliminary data we have gotten on the on this canyon so uh, another important thing about this so location though is that it has been um, uh, several surveys have assessed the presence of active methane seeps in the in the in this location which means that this is an important target of exploratory and biological research because not only do we need to protect these ecosystems from forthcoming explorations for methane deposits, but also because these methane seeps could support the development of chemosynthetic communities. So chemosynthetic communities are based on bacteria as primary producers that use chemical energy to fix carbon, sort of like on the surface the algae do for the corals. So this could be a, a, a a very interesting alternative metabolic strategy that we can study in this environment. So this is just to thank everybody, all the people that have helped to get all these data uh, and, and also uh, I will, I hope to increase the number of dots on this map with many other collaborations in the future. Also with you guys here, which I would love to, to start talking to and to shuffle ideas around and see how we can collaborate on some of, some of these topics. Thank you so much. That was a bit long, sorry. Thank you so much. Um, so questions? Would we like to start with a student? Yeah. So it's been shown that like forum communities are already moving different, different habitats mm. and they're expanding. Is this true? Can you already see coral communities expanding as well? Yes, so there are different species that have different temperature tolerances. So for instance, in the Mediterranean Sea, we are seeing uh, species that uh, have never been found before above uh, more or less Rome. So I'll just show you really quickly, which is basically in the middle of, of Italy. Oof. And, and actually, they have reported this species uh, all the way to the north of Italy, which is, it's, it's a huge change in only a few years. So where is it here? So usually this species, which is a colonial non zox coral actually, so it's, it doesn't even have a symbiosis with algae, has been shown uh, to have expanded its population all the way to the north up here. So there are definitely, this is called um, meridionalization in Italian, so uh, b expansion towards northern uh, latitudes basically. And the same thing has been observed in terms of um, 
alien species that are moving a lot from the Red Sea into the Mediterranean Sea and are completely shuffling around all the communities, communities and the, the ecosystem functions are changing very importantly, yes, so. Yep. You mentioned that um, the main condition of changes was pH. Yes. Was because it's close to vent, was temperature changing as well? No, so we made sure that temperature did not change along this, this pH gradient and the, the what allowed us to perform this experiment was really the, the relatively short distance uh, between the two extremes. So before we actually started doing experiments there, we did a very thorough characterization of the environmental conditions, including nutrients. So we measured nutrients, we measured temperature, alkalinity, everything. And it turned out that the only parameter that we measured that also salinity, the change was really the pH. And this allowed us to perform actually uh, transplant experiments in different seasons, so under different environmental te uh, temperatures, to see how uh, not only did corals respond to decreasing pH, but how also the effect of temperature could uh, be acting synergistically or additively in, in the responses we were observing. So, yeah. And I have a second question. Yep. Like, I feel like this study is relative to climate changes, obviously. Yes. But I was wondering, the community that you're observing is kind of like settle and to, uh, to some time to adopt. So I wonder in this application to climate changes, would it be possible to make an experiment or measure how quickly the community adapt mm. to this condition? Because I feel like it's settled already. It's been yeah. probably for hundreds of years while we how do we see the fast response? Yeah, so this particular ecosystem uh, natural laboratory uh, probably is not the ideal place to study this, but uh, you can do this, for instance, using upwelling systems. So for instance, the one I, I was mentioning in Costa Rica, this upwelling system uh, drives uh, deep, low pH currents from the, from the bottom, from deep depths all the way to the surface and acidifies the reefs there for a few months at a time. And so you could really try and, and observe how uh, at least phenotypic changes in terms of physiology, in terms of things you can, or like gene expression, are being affected by, uh, by this changing pH condition. And, and then also observe after the, 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 the low pH condition is over and then you have normal pH conditions again, how the, ch the corals change again. This is possible. Uh, to, we can do this by measuring specific parameters, but to measure differences in species composition and, and at the ecosystem level, I think it, it's, I don't think it's possible to do that. In would it be possible to create like a typical experiment where you would decrease pH in some like local region oh. uh, officially? I mean, they would probably add corals, like but it, it would be valid for... So like a mesocosmic, a mesocosmic experiment in which you vary the conditions of the seawater in, in, in situ, basically. Well, what they're doing, they're trying to do something like that because they're trying to, to study how enhanced alkali alkalinity can uh, affect local communities and how this might help them actually uh, respond and uh, be more res resilient to changes pH conditions. So um, they might be doing something like that uh, for experiments like that. But yeah, I mean, it, it's complicated to, to control uh, these parameters in the field. So I don't know. I don't think I really believe that too much. Yes? Hi. Hi. That was fascinating. <laughs> thank you very much. Oh, thank you. These aspects of your work. Thank and you. And I was wondering, from the perspective of isotopes, if you use boron isotopes, have you used calcium isotopes to study any of these effects for the mass-dependent uh, processes? I haven't, but I, I've been talking about this actually with a colleague with Corday. So uh, we were thinking of applying uh, calcium isotopes maybe to investigate how, uh, uh, ch how changes in calcification rate take place by using calcium. This is something I, I, I've been, I'm looking forward to getting more information on and understanding how it works. And I would love to try and do that, especially to assess how it affects calcification in foraminifera, which are, I, I would not know how to investigate calcification aside from maybe using calcium, but that would be a nice, uh, 
Yeah, absolutely. Yep. I, I was wondering, following up on the boron isotopes, so I think you alluded to this, boron isotopes are often used in paleo settings to understand past pH. And I was just wondering, um, so from the perspective of if, the, if that fluid where the corals are actually forming seemed to be sort of buffered, like even if external yeah. pH was changing, yeah. but the fluid pH was not. That could affect. So what are the implications for interpreting these records where we're really trying to get at the pH of seawater from looking at calcifying organisms? Yeah, isotopes? that's actually a huge thing because uh, these pH changes at the calcifying fluid level are very species specific. So what I know is that what they usually do, I mean, not, first of all, not all species are good paleo, paleo proxies. And so uh, what, what I know, what they try to do is, is calibrate uh, based on the differences that we observe in the corals today, they try to calibrate uh, and, and count, like, uh, counteract for the difference in external and internal seawater pH, creating these calibration curves. However, uh, I think this is, uh, this is very complicated and I don't think we fully, um, uh, we give it as, I don't think we know how much this could really affect paleoproxies, especially because I'm pretty sure this fluid changes depending on the age of the organism, so with ontology. And uh, usually to for, for paleoproxy studies, they just take the bulk, whatever bulk organism you have in there, but the organism is actually made of different layers which correspond to different times of their life. And so that creates large variability, I think. In, in the signals that you can get. So yeah, I think maybe corals, from what I, from my understanding, are not considered the best candidate for this kind of polyproxy studies. Other organisms that show less, uh, less uh, pronounced vital effects, such as forums, for instance, are, are more used. So this is, this is my understanding on the topic. Maybe one last question, or we could thank our speaker. Yeah, thank you. Again. Thank you.